Welcome everyone to uh, this session of BC Support Unit's webinar series. Uh, I'm pleased to welcome you uh, on this, what is a, currently a beautiful sunny day in the city of Vancouver. For those of you who are across the province, I hope that you are also enjoying lovely weather. Um, you may have noted that I've muted you when you entered. We'll keep you muted so that our presenters are not interrupted by background noise, but we will unmute at the end for a uh, question and answer period or discussion period. Uh, and you'll also be able to use the chat box if you prefer for participating in that session. Um, I'd like to start our webinar by um, acknowledging the traditional territories of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh and Squamish nations from whose traditional lands we are leading this meeting today. I'd also like to begin by introducing Linda Lee, who is the lead of the um, I'm going to unmute you, Linda, so you can speak, um, who is the lead of the KTIS um, methods cluster for the BC Support Unit. Uh, Linda, I'm going to start sharing my screen so that we can take a look at the slide deck together. And while I'm doing that, maybe you want to make a couple of introductory remarks. Absolutely. Thank you, Pat. And good afternoon, everyone. I'm so pleased for all of you to join the um, Knowledge Translation and Implementation Science Methods Cluster update. Uh, if we can go to the next slide. All right. So, um, again, my name is Linda Lee. I am the lead of the uh, Methods Cluster, and I have the pleasure to present on behalf of uh, Dr. Beth Holmes, who's also um, on, on the call, as I can see her name there um, uh, uh, in the teleconference. And uh, Beth is the advisor of the Methods Cluster. And I would also like to acknowledge the uh, tremendous effort uh, of Alison Holmes, who is the um, knowledge translation specialist of the uh, uh, BC support unit. And she has done a tremendous amount of work in uh, pulling this um, uh, work plan and projects together. Linda, Lynn, I just uh, unmuted Bev in case she wants to make any remarks. Bev, are you interested in saying anything? Hello, everyone. <laughs> That's it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Bev. Good to see you, Bev. <laughs> okay, so um, you can go to the next slide. Thank you. So, um, so for today, um, in addition to providing an update of the progress of the Methods Cluster, I'm also really pleased to introduce five projects, and uh, you'll hear from the lead of the projects in, in a moment. And I will end by talking about the next step of the cluster. Next, please. KT and Implementation Science, as you know, is one of the six methods cluster of the BC Support Unit. So between March and August 2017, we conducted consultations with the KT and Implementation uh, Science community to develop common goals in, um, uh, for a province-wide work plan. One of the major activities that many of you have participated in was a visioning meeting in March uh, 2017 in Vancouver, and there were 40 people uh, engaged in that activity. And following the meeting, we hosted further consultation uh, through webinars, uh, teleconferences, and individuals' uh, meetings with researchers across the province, uh, and this consultation process has subsequently generated four themes for projects that can potentially um, advance the science and uh, the science of KT and implementation, which is really exciting. Next, please. So these themes um, include uh, a wide variety of things. Uh, it has a focus on advancing the use of innovative uh, research methods for uh, studying KT and implementation intervention as well as uh, methods for ensuring diversity in KT and implementation activities. Our stakeholders also support the focus on, on studying methods for scaling up effective implementation interventions and to develop new ways to engage the public in health research based on the citizen science approach. And I'll tell you a little bit more about uh, this, this approach in a moment. Next, please. Um, so moving forward, these themes were published um, in, uh, on the support unit website, newsletters, and uh, the consultation report. We then had an open call uh, for projects 
that address at least one of these themes. And uh, Beth, Allison, and myself have worked with individuals and, and their teams who were interested to develop their projects. So this afternoon, I, uh, you will hear from the leads of the five projects listed here. Uh, we have Dr. Nelly Oki from UBCO, who is uh, leading a very interesting uh, uh, project to study uh, consensus methods in integrated knowledge translation to promote patient-oriented research. Dr. Matthew McLeod from UNDC will talk about a, a very interesting idea of using the hermeneutic approach to advance implementation science. Um, Dr. Alan Beth, we're very uh, pleased to have him to be with us today from InSource and UBC, and they're developing a, 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 what I think is a truly uh, innovative way to uh, engage communities in resource planning, and they're going to develop systems thinking tools for non-researchers, which, which is a really uh, amazing effort. Um, Dr. Sarah Monroe from UBC will take a different spin to look at uh, the use of documentaries as a method of knowledge translation uh, to reach a very hard to reach population, namely parents with young children. And I will end by uh, sharing with you a um, cross methods cluster initiative uh, to advance integrated knowledge translation. So without further delay, I'm going to pass on to, uh, to Dr. Oki. Just going to need to unmute Dr. Olke. Bear with me one moment, please. Okay, Great. Nice. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Linda, for your introduction, and um, I'm really happy to present on behalf of my uh, team uh, that uh, information on studying consensus methods uh, in integrated knowledge translation uh, to promote patient-oriented research. So the project leads are, include myself, uh, plus Heather Gainforth from UBC Okanagan, uh, Katrina Plamondon from Interior Health and UBC Okanagan, and Davina Banner from UNBC. We also have co-researchers or co-eyes involved, uh, Kate Sibley from uh, Manitoba and Jennifer Bombush from UBC Vancouver. And we, research users, we are in the process of um, talking to uh, patient partners as well as decision makers from the health authorities around our project. Next slide, Pat. So why study consensus methods? Well, there's very little information in the literature on priority setting and consensus methods, uh, particularly in the use in the KT and IKT area. We also um, know that it's important to um, look at evidence-based solutions to address the priorities and needs of communities, and then also incorporating patient priorities. So different consensus methods could include such uh, components as Delphi uh, methodology, nominal group, and deliberative dialogue. And we're doing a literature, a systematic review, so we may indeed find others as well. So for example, deliberative dialogue has been used for practice and policy change for MP integration and family violence prevention. The MP integration study is a study that we did um, in the interior region um, about four years ago with a, a very um, fairly successful uh, uh, deliberative dialogue approach. Next slide. So the aim of the project is to better understand effective consensus methods for use in IKT and patient-oriented research. Specific objectives, we want to know um, how researchers and research users uh, working in partnership are using consensus methods, so how can we actually partner together and use them together for um, uh, an integrated knowledge translation approach. We will compare, contrast, and test different consensus methods, and we will develop guidance that supports IKT user, researchers and research users to use the methods uh, in their work. Next slide. So this is a bit of a busy slide, and that's because we were limited to three slides. <laughs> 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 yeah. 
Yeah, <laughs> that's okay, Allison. I get it. Um, anyways, we have three phases uh, in our projects that are all being co-led by uh, or led by uh, one of the uh, co-PIs. So we're doing a knowledge synthesis, which is being led by Heather Gainforth. Uh, she will be conducting uh, with her um, trainees uh, a scoping review of the IKT partnership literature and then also conducting a systematic review of partnership review papers, so a review of reviews. And then we will actually have interviews with researchers and research users to talk about how they've used consensus methods and to guide, and to, to guide their decision making. Phase two will be the bulk of our project uh, and will occur in years two and three. And this is where we have the little figure here to outline what we're going to do. So initially, we're going to have a virtual deliberative dialogue um, to, make a, uh, to, to gain consensus on a second method to test in, in phase three. So we will test deliberative dialogue, but we would like to test another consensus method as well. And we will include knowledge users and other key stakeholders from across the province to uh, help us make this decision. The second stage then will be uh, conducting two deliberative dialogues, uh, one in rural and one in an urban center with patients and community members to determine how best we can include these um, individuals uh, in consensus building methods. And then in stage three, we will test three approaches of deliberative dialogue and additional consensus methods uh, determined in stage one. And we'll test one approach in each of the BC health authorities. And we're going to test um, the, looking at a face-to-face -face deliberative dialogue, at a virtual deliberative dialogue, and then a combination of face-to-face -face and virtual where we will send facilitators out uh, to an area. And then we'll also test um, the three scenarios with another consensus uh, building method as well. Our um, focus of our study is going to be looking at um, care transitions uh, in mental health from uh, hospital to community. We need to have an issue that we can actually build consensus around. And so we're studying the method, but hoping also that our work will then um, be valuable in moving uh, improvements in care transitions forward as well. Finally, in phase three, uh, led by Dr. Banner, we will um, engage knowledge users and partners and stakeholders uh, to create and implement relevant and responsive end of grant KT activities. KT will be addressed throughout the project, but um, the actual development of resources, et cetera, will be uh, done in phase three. And so we're looking at things um, such as specific resources for decision makers, policy makers, patients, a toolkit, uh, perhaps, and a case book of um, uh, story, narrative stories. Thank you. Unfortunately, I need to leave the presentation. I have a prior engagement, so uh, please uh, feel free to uh, email me with any questions. Um, that would be great. Thank you, Nellie. So then um, next up will be uh, Dr. Martha McLeod. Hi there, folks. Um, I pleased to talk about our uh, project, which is a hermeneutic approach to advancing implementation science. Now, you might wonder what hermeneutics is, and I'll tell you after I've told you about who we've got on our, on our group. I'm the project lead here at UNBC. Our researchers are Dave Snadden, who is the Doctors of BC Rural Health, uh, Rural Health Research Chair. Graham McCaffrey is a faculty member at the University of Calgary with uh, a long um, experience in doing hermeneutic research. Leela Zimmer at uh, University of Northern BC and Aaron Wilson are both hermeneutic scholars. Ian Graham is uh, at University of Ottawa and is working with us as a sober second thought about an uh, approach to hermeneutics. Um, our research users at this point are Kathy Ulrich, who is the 
CEO of Northern Health, and Peter Zimmer, who is our patient partner. We're anticipating gaining patient partners as we work um, through the research approach and see what kinds of implementation processes we're going to be studying. So the rationale, the next slide, please, Pat. Um, the rationale here is um, based on what hermeneutics um, actually is. Hermeneutics is, is looking at meaning, language, and um, how the things happen based on individual and context-specific understandings in the midst of the everyday. It looks at the complexity of practice and of, of, can, of the organizations in and of the everyday, but it looks importantly at the temporal nature of it, the time, how things move through time, relationships, how things work in interconnections with each other. And we aim to um, address some of the issues uh, that are there in health system implementation uh, endeavors, which not unsurprisingly are often linear. They identify specific gaps and problems and try to address them one at a time, coming from a research paradigm that, uh, that works very well in that way. So what we're trying to, to do is to know more about how the practitioners, um, other knowledge users, patients and researchers actually work together every day as they create and implement evidence and practice innovations. Now, there's an assumption in the basis here that knowledge is created in the midst of everyday practice and merits, uh, merits exploration of that uh, creation as well as the implementation of externally derived um, evidence. Now, this approach we think is particularly relevant in rural and northern practice settings where um, externally derived evidence sometimes just doesn't fit. And the idea of contextualizing, already decontextualized knowledge and recontextualizing is sometimes quite um, challenging. So what we're trying to look at is new ways of understanding research implementation, those practice innovations, and then how there is that ongoing um, contextualization and use. So when you come to the, um, uh, the next one, which are the objectives, is that our, our aim is to articulate what it means to take a philosophical hermeneutic approach to implementation science. Now articulation includes both naming being clear about and connecting. So that will characterize the approach that we take. You can see that we've got two objectives. One is to summarize the existing evidence on philosophical hermeneutics uh, approaches to implementation science. And there's been, um, a, there are a number of hermeneutic studies on, um, in terms of practice, there are only a very few that really look at implementation um, science types of questions. So what we're trying to do is um, advance that fundamental understanding, which includes how is knowing and knowledge formed, reformed, and otherwise contextualized during implementation processes in rural, remote, and northern settings, and how practitioners, patients, and other knowledge users and researchers learn and change and advance both practice and knowing in the midst of implementing evidence and generating knowledge in order for that implementation actually to happen. Now in Northern Health, there, uh, there is a implementation processes, uh, particularly around primary health care going on, and using a process, using a questioning process and a process of dialogue that is based um, in a hermeneutic uh, place. And we may be uh, studying uh, part of that process as, as we go forward. So that takes us to our methods and our the next uh, slide. So the first slide would be a scoping review of the use of hermeneutics in the field of implementation science. And a scoping review because we don't know what's out there yet. We need to come to a, a better articulation of what hermeneutics uh, is in, uh, the, in the context of implementation. We're taking the philosophical hermeneutic approach because in the true uh, perspective of qualitative research, the 
ontological, the way of being, and the epistemological way of knowing concerns set up um, how people study and how we then, the kind of knowledge that comes out about uh, the qualitative aspects of language and meaning. So we're going in depth, we're looking at, at um, our, our research approach allows us to go in depth. So we're going to be looking at about, uh, we're going to do that knowledge synthesis and then have an interview and observation study. In our previous research, we found that it isn't enough just to ask people about what they do because so much of what people do as they move in their everyday practice is taken for granted and not articulated. So we are um, going to have study sites, about 10 to 12 communities. We're looking at about 40 people um, with researchers, research partners, physicians and other practitioners and patient partners needing to do some delineation of the um, more concrete Use, um, familiar taking a research project, the data from research or the synthesis of, of, of evidence, research evidence, and then implementing it versus the implementation processes that happen in the midst of quality improvement often, and they are, um, but they have evidence as a research evidence, the component of it. So we're going to have to tease apart some of those things. We're going to have some individual and small group interviews. We're going to be shadowing. And we will undertake a multi-phase process of analysis and interpretation. Now, in terms of um, knowledge translation, it is an entire process of integrated knowledge translation. And we find that telling the stories of it will illuminate the meaning and, and show this. So both in uh, written material we'll provide, as well as we believe that we'll do some digital storytelling. We're not yet sure at this point whether or not we'll be able to do that as part of this grant or whether or not we'll need to get some additional funding to, to move on with the digital storytelling. One of our team members, Leela Zinner, um, has some expertise in that area and will be helping us as we move forward. So there we are with, with our project and I'm looking forward to hearing the others and thank you very much. I'll be staying on the line and you can certainly ask questions or, or give comments afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Dr. McLeod. And um, for those of you who are on the phone, uh, if you're not a speaker, please mute it and I'll pass on to uh, Dr. Best. Thanks, Linda. And I have to thank Martha for that uh, great presentation. It really sets up what we're going to be talking about in many ways, our two projects are addressing this, the same problem, but in different ways. Just to overview again, what our project's about is looking at the problem that communities are often looking at really truly complex systems with multiple partner organizations. And in order to adapt the evidence to local context, what they need are some easy to use tools that will really help them map strategy and build capacity. Um, this project is going to take some well-tested uh, tools and adapt them for online use by communities with minimal experts' uh, input. So I'll be providing the overall project leadership and uh, direction. Greg brings his rich depth of knowledge around systems thinking tools. Jen Terpster is going to lead the development of the knowledge products and of the evaluation strategy and also lead the uh, facilitating of the in-person meetings and webinars with our community collaborators. Mary Claire Zach is a really key community partner. She oversees the Healthy City strategy in Vancouver, and that includes the work with the neighborhood houses that will be our direct hands-on partners in this work. Jen Bitt will provide the overall project management, and we have three systems thinking experts to advise as we move forward. Uh, Brenda leads the Human Early Learning Project at, UB, at uh, UBC has uh, leadership around a lot of the system level factors that they look at there and in particular currently has an SSHRC grant to use one of our tools, concept mapping, as part of her work there and we'll also be working with the research associate for that project who will be working on this one too. Shazan leads and uh, founded and leads Live 5210 which is a community-based childhood obesity prevention program. They are currently involved uh, using a systems approach in some 12 different communities across BC. 
And Diane brings a very strong background in systems thinking and how that's applied to defining, designing, and implementing interventions. Next slide, please. So Vancouver's neighborhood houses are OVR our partners, and they're a key component in this city strategy to build capacity in local communities. The neighborhood houses offer programs like parenting, food security, newcomer language training, seniors, counseling and support, legal and tax assistance, fitness, arts and crafts, you name it. They basically really have become true hubs for the community, especially so for those who have low SES or are at risk of low SES. Working with that, InSource brings the initiative for the study and implementation of systems project that we facilitated for the National Institutes of Health in the U.S. several years ago. It was a two-year think tank where we convened an international panel of experts in systems thinking from diverse disciplines to identify what might be the most useful tools and concepts to address complex public health problems. Next slide, please. So how might this work then? Well, Concept mapping asks people to brainstorm actions that might help to solve a priority challenge. A mixture of qualitative and quantitative uh, analyses result in a common language and logic, which then is diverse groups involved with the neighborhood houses can work, use to work together more easily. Network analysis analyzes the strengths and the weaknesses of how community organizations connect and collaborate. Network maps answer the question, who is doing what? And then the stakeholders can better plan out who might be doing what a little bit differently to work together to achieve our goals. Causal loop diagrams look at the interactions in the system, describing the relationships between the different puzzle pieces and identifying the critical success factors and leverage points in the system. So in sum, systems thinking tools develop shared understanding, strengthen network relations, pinpoint priority actions for local context, and develop feedback loops. Next slide, please. So the four expected outcomes that we have are to produce a, an online toolbox that's going to be disseminated and made freely available via the City of Vancouver's website, the BC Support Unit website, and the InSource website. We're going to provide evaluation tools that can be used for ongoing monitoring of the uptake of the toolbox and its effectiveness in building local community capacity for systems thinking for implementation problems. It's going to result in feasibility studies using the looking at the toolbox as an intervention to advance the science of its implementation by building capacity for systems thinking. And it's going to provide information of user experience in developing these tools, which then could be applied to other projects as well. Next slide, please, Adam. So we'll work face-to-face -face with the neighborhood houses initially to develop the toolbox. Community collaborators will review materials, complete surveys, and take part in webinars online. We'll work sequentially with three different pairs of neighborhood houses. An initial development phase of the toolbox will work collaboratively with the first pair to adapt the face-to-face -face methods typically used for online versions. An interactive refinement phase will look at the revision with feedback from a second uh, two neighborhood houses. And finally, a third feasibility pair of neighborhood houses will not have access to the research team to answer questions They'll work with the schools and complete an online survey and then participate to provide qualitative feedback in a webinar. We'll use quantitative data and summarize it in a variety of descriptive statistics to show what's going on with these tools. And then the thematic analysis will be conducted independently by using two research teams simultaneously to ensure the trustworthiness of the data. So, stop there and look forward to the discussion. Thank you. This is fantastic. Um, Dr. Monroe, you're up next. One moment while I unmute Dr. Monroe. Dr. Monroe, over to you. Hi there. Thank you so much, everybody, for your presentation so far. It's exciting to see what others in the cluster are engaging in for their projects. 
Um, and it's my pleasure to introduce to you what we're doing for our team's uh, demonstration project. I'm the project lead for this particular study. Um, the collaborating researchers include Dr. Brett Finley, who is a microbiologist at UBC, who's created the Let Them Eat Dirt documentary that we're studying in this research. Stephanie Gleig is a trainee in the School of Population and Public Health, and her area of research is knowledge translation and implementation science, so she brings a lot of expertise to our project. Theodora Lamb is our parent partner. She is a community organizer and is assisting us in identifying other parent partners for the project. Annalise Larson is a digital media strategist. So for this um, media-focused uh, KT study, she brings a great deal of expertise in her particular area, as well as Rivka Beth Meadow, who is a documentary producer and is producing the Let the Meat Dirt documentary. Next slide, please. Well, why study documentaries? Um, documentaries are an understudied but essentially powerful strategy to enhance knowledge and behavior change. Uh, documentary can convey meaning, experience, knowledge, and emotions, and it can tell the story of a body of research through a persuasive narrative. Ultimately, the goal of a documentary is to change the audience's knowledge, attitudes, and behaviors. Um, putting educational or research messages in an entertaining documentary can potentially persuade or nudge the audience toward change. There's also a large evidence base suggesting that narratives delivered by audio and video are more effective than print in changing audience behavior. They have the potential to reduce health disparities for vulnerable and hard to reach audiences. But the mechanisms by which health documentaries facilitate audience change has received little study. So how do they work? Uh, what formats work best? Is a documentary or video as a KT tool a worthwhile investment for researchers? And what are best practices? And who could benefit? So the sandwich generation, that's including working adults in their 30s and 40s who are caregivers to young children and or aging parents, and they're sandwiched between the needs of their family and their workplace. Uh, in Canada, roughly one in five adults takes care of a child and an aging parent. And this trend is expected to increase in part due to delayed childbearing and our aging population. The Sanders generation is a critical public health audience, but they have limited leisure time to consume health information. So how do we reach the sandwich generation? Documentaries are one promising approach. They can also be edited into short clips and into media that can hook the viewer. Uh, short with these video clips could be an acceptable and feasible KT strategy for this hard to reach and very critical public health audience. Uh, understanding how video clips might work is also important for patient-oriented research so that we can understand what methods work effectively when we're translating knowledge with hard to reach audiences. So one area of research that's ideally situated for this type of knowledge translation is the role of microbes in childhood development. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? There's been a recent shift in our understanding of how allergies, uh, asthma, childhood obesity, and other related childhood immune diseases develop. Microbes in our intestines, that's our gut microbiome, they play a critical role in shaping the immune system during early life and our susceptibility to these diseases. Parents and caregivers largely are not aware of this evidence. For instance, there is limited knowledge of emerging data uh, that suggests that exposing newborns to the mother's healthy vaginal and skin microbes soon after delivery can have important long-term health benefits. And so understanding this evidence, Dr. Brett Finley, uh, one of our study co-investigators, he wrote a book on this topic called Let Them Eat Dirt. Um, he was successful in gaining funding to turn it into a documentary. And the aim of our study, thank you for changing the slide, is to evaluate this documentary as a KT method and to identify best practices for producing future documentaries involving health research evidence. We want to understand what works for whom, how, and in what circumstances to facilitate, to facilitate uptake of health-related research evidence among the sandwich generation in the context of this documentary, and more broadly, to explore the feasibility, acceptability, and the effect of the documentary as well as the supporting media that we develop. Is it useful, for instance, to translate the documentary into short video clips to disseminate microbe 
assistance to parents. Next slide, please. Our design is a mixed methods, theory-driven realist evaluation approach consisting of two phases. We'll be recruiting English-speaking participants who reside in Canada and who are expectant parents, parents of young children, social media influencers, as well as secondary audiences, such as grandparents and educators. In phase one, our needs assist assessment will include interviews to identify the format and the messaging of supporting media for the documentary. And that research will be conducted in close partnership with Annalise Larson and Rivka Beth Meadows, who are our digital media and documentary experts in the study. And then in phase two, once Let the Meet Dirt has been aired on PBS and the social media um, supporting media have been circulated online, we'll conduct interviews as well as a brief survey and collect reach and impact metrics. Our multidisciplinary team will work together to conduct a thematic analysis of the data and identify what works for whom, how, and under what circumstances. And at the end of this study, we hope to identify the characteristics of KT tools that are acceptable and usable for the sandwich generation. Uh, we have additional funding from an allergen grant to do end of grant KT to disseminate these learnings to the research community. And we hope that the lessons we learned from the study can be adapted for other health topics that impact caregivers and their families. We'll also identify best practices for documentary production, uh, which will fill a critical gap in the KT literature and hopefully provide guidance to researchers who are seeking to disseminate the findings to a broader public audience. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we're going to move on to talk about the last project. Um, can I have the slides, please? Yep, thank you. So uh, this last project is an integrated knowledge translation project that aims to um, develop an online portal to engage the public in generating research questions. This is um, what we call multi-methods cluster project within the support unit. And as you can see there, the project leads include myself as well as Dr. Leanne Curry, who is uh, the lead of the data science and health informatic methods cluster, and Dr. Aaron McCallick. Uh, from both uh, uh, Dr. Curry and Dr. McKay from UBC, and uh, Dr. McKay is the lead of the uh, patient engagement method cluster. We also have uh, two um, researcher partners from Simon Fraser University, Dr. Chris Shaw and Dr. D Diane Grumella. Both of them are uh, experienced computer scientists and have a lot of um, uh, insight into how to make uh, web-based portals, user-friendly and engaging uh, for a variety of populations. We also have um, three um, very engaged and um, highly skilled um, uh, research users in terms of their uh, expertise in uh, social media and uh, digital media tools. Cheryl Cohen is the president of Arthritis Consumer Experts, Delia Cooper from Patient Voices Network, and Sunny Liu who is uh, from, from the Patient Council of the Support Unit. Next, please. So at the core of uh, inter integrated knowledge translation is the practice of engaging knowledge users throughout the research process. Now, um, as we know, public and uh, patient engagement in research has been credited for a number of good things, including its ability to illuminate new areas of uh, uh, inquiry as well as um, improving the ways that we uh, plan and conduct research and uh, how we do knowledge translation in sharing evidence. A recent systematic review has noted that a lot of these patient engagement activities actually concentrate at the preparation stage uh, mm -hmm. of the research process, such as setting research priorities. There are a variety of ways and strategies that people use at this particular stage uh, anywhere from um, engaging knowledge users um, such as patients and caregivers in informal consultation, all the way to um, large organized activities such as uh, the priority setting activities used by James Lind Alliance. Now, these are great strategies, but a limitation of them is that the ideas that are generated from um, these type of activities usually will reflect the perspectives of um, individuals who are invited and present um, in the process. 
but it may not represent uh, those of the larger target population. So, next please. So to address this issue, there are actually a number of commercial uh, websites that are uh, available to allow people to network and contribute in health data with the uh, ultimate goal of generating uh, useful research questions for for a um, variety of conditions. So, um, for example, web portals such as the one that you're looking at called Patients Like Me, this type of port, this particular portal um, is currently engaging 600,000 um, people around the world in generating data. So people can log onto the website and they can report their symptoms, the severity of the sim the, their, their, um, their conditions, what kind of treatments that they've been using, um, as well as how effective they are as they perceive it. People can also contribute uh, qualitative data, such as their own stories in managing the disease. Now, this type of platform provides a really powerful platform, uh, a forum to collect a massive amount of data uh, that could be used to generate research questions and hypotheses. And it is particularly useful for um, rare conditions. So, uh, for example, lupus, uh, that it affects one in 2,000 people, is actually incredibly difficult to um, find individuals and, and engage them in, uh, in the research process. But in patients like me, as I checked uh, a few days ago, there are 30,000 people contributing data uh, about their health. So one of the issues of these type of um, websites, however, is that um, they're usually privately owned and not accessible to the uh, academic research community. Next, please. So within the BC support unit, we have created a citizen science initiative which involves expertise from knowledge translation science, data science, and patient engagement. Uh, the vision of this initiative is to transform how patients and the public can be engaged in generating research questions. Uh, and the way we do it is to, buy, is to develop a um, web-based portal based on the citizen science uh, approach. So dated back to around the 1990s, Citizen science can be broadly um, defined as um, uh, a social movement in which the public are uh, actively engaged in um, scientific activities through their, uh, their knowledge, their intellectual effort, their resources, or even by contributing their own information, such as the health-related data um, and lived, ex uh, uh, lived experiences. The use of uh, or the popularity of wearable devices, for example, is one of um, the, the, um, the, the type of tools that helps to uh, engage the public to generate a large amount of physical activity data, which could be used for uh, a variety uh, of anal analysis to generate uh, research questions related to people's lifestyle, for example. So, as mentioned, um, this project uh, it involves three methods clusters. And for the part that is led by KT and Implementation Science, our objectives are to create a user-friendly, oh, uh, please go back to the last slide, please. Uh, to, to create a user-friendly um, front end for uh, a web-based portal for people to rate different aspects of their health um, and also to contribute narratives of their health-related experiences. We will um, conduct usability tests for the web app to make sure that it is user-friendly um, and engaging, and um, also to evaluate the feasibility of using these type of apps uh, to collect data from the public. Next, please. So the development of this, um, uh, the, the web app data architecture, as well as the patient engagement methodology will be detailed in the work plans uh, led by um, Leanne Curry and uh, Aaron McKellick from their um, uh, methods cluster. So for um, KT and implementation, we focus on the app development. So um, we will apply the best methods of design thinking to uh, create a product that is both easy to use and engaging um, to, um, uh, uh, for the public. And we will also uh, apply a rapid um, prototyping approach, which involves engaging or interacting with, uh, uh, having users to interact with the evolving prototype so that the developers can uh, continuously find out and further develop components that works for the target users. 
we will then test the user friendliness of the app prototype uh, but with 20 people, 10 men and 10 women uh, in, in BC communities and, um, and uh, uh, individuals well, with at least one type of chronic condition or um, disability. And what we will do is to observe the way that they interact with the app and make further refinement before we then release it to, uh, to the real world and where we're going to recruit 50 people to test the feasibility of using this app to engage the public in contributing data. So specifically, we are going to measure, um, assess the acceptability of this type of tool by interviewing the participants um, in, uh, in the feasibility study. And we're also going to track their usage data to see how they interact uh, with the app functions. We will look at the uh, implementation uh, as the feasibility outcome. So we will assess um, how fast we can recruit the 50 people as well as the um, number of technical issues that they report uh, or they experience when, uh, when they use it in, in real world. And finally, we will assess the practicality of the tool by recording how well these uh, participants are able to uh, follow the app usage protocol. So coming back to the project themes, next slide, please. So coming back to the, uh, the, to the uh, project themes, um, we're really delighted that all five of the projects have a focus on developing and studying new methods to ensure diversity in, in KT and implementation activities, which is theme number two. Um, the, Herm the, um, hermene the hermeneutic uh, pr uh, project led by Dr. McLeod is one of the great examples that I think was going to advance the um, innovative research methods for studying KT interventions, especially uh, in rural and remote communities. And uh, the documentary projects, as explained by Dr. Monroe, is uh, another great example that, uh, the, that allow us to explore you know, a, a, new, a, a method to help scaling up dissemination of evidence um, to the public, especially for the re harder to reach population. And, um, and, and uh, many of the projects that we've presented today also address the emerging field of citizen science and it is it, and, and its potential in uh, advancing integrated knowledge translation, which is uh, theme, number, theme number four. So I think we're doing incredibly well in having this amazing group of scientists and um, and, and interesting projects that uh, we can put forward uh, for the methods cluster. Next slide, please. So it, with regard to um, the steps uh, to follow. The uh, work plan, which includes the five projects, has passed the internal review by a science council within the support unit, and, it, and the work plan is currently being re reviewed by external um, uh, scientists uh, to provide further feedback to help us to um, refine or, uh, uh, or to um, anything that we should pay attention to for any one of those, any of the projects. And the external review process should uh, complete by July 2018, and we expect that the projects will launch around August 2018. I would like to thank the op uh, take the opportunity to thank uh, the project leads for coming forward and putting together a team and, and really amazing projects uh, for the uh, support unit. And I, we're very grateful for the support unit to be able to uh, 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 advance these projects as well. Um, next slide, please. So uh, to end, uh, I would welcome your questions, and if you have any um, thoughts and, uh, and, and, and uh, things that you would like to discuss, please feel free to reach myself uh, and Allison Holmes by email, and you can always find us on Twitter. For some reason, we seem to be on Twitter a lot, um, and so uh, happy to engage everyone in uh, separate conversations as well as uh, open conversation on Twitter. So um, thank you again, and Pat, over to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee. We really appreciate you leading us through that conversation. I think I speak for everybody here at the BC Support Unit office here on West Broadway when I say that was extremely illuminating. I feel better informed. I'm sure everyone else does as well. At this time, I'm going to open up the microphones for anybody who might have um, questions. Oh.
I'm going to mute everybody. <laughs> and if you have a question, please use the chat function, or you can unmute yourself if you're guaranteed. We're not going to get that background horror that we just had. So the chat function is located in a little box on the right-hand side of your screen. It looks like a little uh, cartoon bubble or dialogue bubble that you see in a comic book. Uh, click that and enter your question there. Uh, and I'm happy to read it aloud. I see that Erin had to leave early. Um, she did say this is a great webinar, great webinar, and kudos to all the presenters. So all those who presented, Erin says thank you. Uh, any questions from the audience, either by chat or by voice? Any questions from the room here? Or comments? Well, one of the things I'm really struck by is that the projects really have a variety of that weave them together. And I, and I think that's one thing that the you folks might want to think about is how can you take advantage of that? Do we want to bring these different teams together to talk about some of those underlying things and how we could leverage them to get greater advantage from the project? They really are a very consistent set of projects to move this forward. I think that's right. So, uh, I, mean, I, I mean, thanks so much to everyone who's, uh, who's been involved in this process, the leadership from, from uh, Linda and Bev, and from Allison, and uh, and the project leadership as well, uh, thank uh, and the teams. It's, it's it's great to see. So yeah, I, I think that that question about the KT of the KTIS um, methods cluster is is actually a really important one. And like, how do we ensure that uh, these this great work is actually going to lead to impact? I've got every confidence that we've got the teams that know how to do that. But maybe we should at least. Uh, uh, acknowledge that that's an important piece that we uh, that we need to, to work on and uh, are working on. I don't know whether that's for Allison or for Linda or for anyone else. I would 100% support that, and I think uh, um, you know also uh, reiterating Sterling's words and Alan's words when we have um, capable teams throughout the province undertaking exciting work that's been enabled through the support unit. I think we can but succeed, but to have the plan of uh, more discrete plan in uh, how to enable next steps after the project, uh, but uh, developing that plan while the projects are still um, being undertaken, um, I, I think that that's the way it goes. Thank you. Yeah. Sarah had a question. Yeah, I'm just going to I'm just going to mention that uh, the, the dulcet tones you're hearing of the male persuasion would be Dr. Sterling Bryan, who is our scientific director. For those who are not familiar with his voice, uh, Sarah, did you have a question? I did. Sorry. <laughs> um, I, I uh, let me look at what I wrote down. Just building on what Alan asked there, I was going to ask if there is a plan or any other. Um, interest in exchanging knowledge with the other clusters and demonstration projects that might emerge from the other clusters? I think it's a really good idea, but as I was listening to the presentations, with every single one, I wrote down things I wanted to follow up on, talk to one of the uh, people on the team about how it would relate to things that we're doing on ours. So uh, why not make that a coordinated effort? Do that something out of the central unit here where we can to see what does that connectivity look like and how can we leverage it. Yeah. So, so maybe I can comment on that, and I and I'm really pleased to hear this um, discussion. So, um, when we developed the work plan, we actually also budget in the coordination. Um, the effort to uh, bring the teams together and do some exchange, uh, you know, in terms of uh, project progress and uh, and to be able to learn from each other. Ellen, I particularly like your idea that you know to bring in the other methods cluster projects to have a, a large exchange, and I'm sure that's something that you know Pat will uh, is pleased to hear about, you know, from the um, education and, and and training perspective. Um, as well, so so definitely that's um, in our minds, and, and Beth can comment as well that um, we we do intend on regularly um, to have um, communication on in terms of the progress of everyone's project and bring everyone together to have you know some face to face time and develop activities because the the idea of the, um, having uh, supporting these projects is to be able to grow them to a point that we can then um, either in the uh, uh, individual projects or 
it's through cross pollination to have really innovative ideas to go for larger funding, such as you know a CIHR project grant, special call, whatever is going to come out. So, um, so, so I thank you for your feedback. I think we're all you know thinking around the same thing. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Um, I see Dr. Holmes would like to make a comment, please. Hi, um, I'm on the same theme here, and I'm. Um, I've really appreciated Linda's often as we're developing these projects has compared this to a, a team grant. And so these are not only individual projects, but they're like a big team grant. So that will necessitate the getting together of these groups, not only to, to, to share and learn so that their own projects that can be better, but we really need to remember that these, the cluster actually has overall objectives. And um, I think, What's been great about working with all of these groups is that we've been able to, it's difficult and many groups aren't able to do this, pull away from the topics that we're studying, which um, are, you know, they're doubtless important, but really what this is about is the methods, regardless of the topic. And I think um, getting together to make, to really focus on those higher level of the methods of KT of implementation. And, and also, how does a methods cluster, you know, there's the highest level of how is actually the methods cluster itself and the set of methods clusters enabling the work. So we've got a number of different levels to look at that will really necessitate us getting together. And I, I also think that I noticed on your second to last slide, Linda, you only had champagne after that third milestone. And I'm really thinking that there's champagne warranted after each of the milestones. So that's just my plug. Sure, we can do that. <laughs> Just to be clear, the champagne's not being paid for by the support. Great. Thank you, Dr. Holmes. Uh, Martha and Sarah, there are questions for you, so I'm unmuting you and I will read to you. Uh, first, two questions indications. Could Dr. McLeod speak a bit more about why they've chosen philosophical hermeneutics, who in the field, et cetera, question mark? Okay, um, we, we selected um, philosophical hermeneutics because it is a, an approach that directly deals with the ongoing temporality and relationship um, of, as one works through the development of knowing and knowledge. And it's because one that uh, several of us have experience in and are incorporating the ways of working into our actual implementation processes as, as we move forward. So that's what we did. Now, if you're looking at, at who are the authors that we draw on, it's largely Gadamer. Uh, it's, it's Gadamer's work and, um, and others working around there. Now, that's one of the pieces that we're going to have to delineate very clear, clearly. Um, and as we go through that scoping review. So that's one of the reasons we want to do that as a part, is to uh, identify that and communicate it. Thank you, Martha. Uh, and the next question is for Sarah. Uh, could Sarah share a bit more about the demographics of the sandwich generation they're looking at? I'm curious particularly about the documentary airing on PBS and how that will relate to participants in phase one. I guess the question is, who will see the documentary when it airs on PBS? That's a great question. So one of our assumptions is that it's going to be difficult for individuals to watch that documentary in the context of their life. So the approach we have is um, taking the documentary and identifying through the needs assessment how to edit it, um, package it, and deliver it in a way that will be more accessible. So for instance, um, we know that uh, we can learn from digital media experts on how to develop viral videos that are short 60 second clips um, circulated on, on Facebook and other social media platforms. And we believe that those um, individual st stories, those short clips, will be easier to digest uh, for our audience compared to watching the documentary on PBS. Um, so we're going to be looking at the mechanisms of the documentary as well as um, shorter supporting media. And the demographics of the audience, we're really looking at um, Canadians between the ages of um, you know, 30 and 50 who have a child who is um, either um, zero to age four or they are pregnant or 
they're thinking about getting pregnant. Um, and we're, want, we're wanting to be able to recruit um, a diverse spectrum of individuals to our sample, which means doing some outreach with our parent partner to ensure that we're um, reaching individuals who may not usually take part in research and are from um, different corners of Canada as well. Thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, we're drawing to a close with our time here. I just want to uh, pass the talking stick over to Allison for closing remarks and an invitation to next webinar. Okay. Uh, thank you again to all the presenters for today. Uh, this uh, ends week three of Methods Cluster Month at uh, the support unit. Uh, so we have recordings of the first uh, two sessions for real-world clinical trials, data science and health informatics. And uh, this recording from today will also be up on uh, the webpage. Um, and next week, please join in for rounding out our fourth and final session, which will be the projects that are being moved forward in health economics and simulation modeling. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Pat. Thanks, Allison. Thanks, everyone. Linda, do you have any last thoughts or comments? No, just thank you uh, for all the presenters and uh, everyone who's joining the, uh, the, the webinar. Great. Thanks so much. Thanks, everyone. I hope everyone who's participating in real time has a pleasant weekend. Thanks, everyone. Bye.